Mars. And oh, crikey. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about why you should make an emulator. Uh, so I guess just quickly run through the aims. So I want to make you kind of think about emulation in a broader sense than perhaps you do already. Uh, convince you that writing an emulator is fun, and obviously I think it's fun, and kind of show you some of the skills you'll learn if you write an emulator and how they can be applied to other fields. Uh, I'll highlight a few areas that might be problematic, and hopefully I'll have time to get onto the FPGAs. Um, so just a bit about me, I'll probably rush through this. Uh, but basically, I guess I've been programming computers for about 30 odd years, and throughout that time, I've kind of I've come across a lot of different systems, and one of the key things that's driven me in kind of learning about new systems is just a kind of fascination with the differences between them and kind of just trying to really understand how things work. Uh, I've ended up in the games industry, which I absolutely love, and it kind of allows me to kind of express a lot of the stuff. And so I just thought I'd comment that all the views are my own, not any employers or anything. So I guess if you think about emulation, this is probably one of the first things that comes to mind. So classic arcade games, they're ideal candidate for emulation, really. Uh, they're kind of made physical hardware. Uh, it's no longer produced. Uh, they're kind of getting older now. Um, kind of As they get older, they're harder to find. Um, when they go wrong, it's harder to find bits that the right, right voltage bits. And just generally, they're hard to maintain. And yet the games themselves are really good fun. They're kind of classics of the genre. Um, and yeah, it, they, I guess it's the kind of thing where um, it, there's kind of no real experience quite like playing the arcade game. Uh, and emulation kind of is the closest you can get to that. Uh, there's also the sense of nostalgia. So like me, you might have been programming the, uh, on an 8-bit computer. Kind of That's your kind of first memories. You might have played your first game on a 2600. Uh, so nostalgia is certainly a good reason for getting into emulation. Um, so the word emulation comes from the Latin, uh, kind of the action form of kind of striving to rival or to surpass some, someone else's efforts. And I guess that's kind of ideal for framing how I want to talk about emulation. Um, so very much a sense of trying to be at least as good as something else and possibly to exceed it. Um, and the, how it applies to computing is generally one system being able to use the software or hardware of another. Um, and so that implies being at least equal with that. Um, so there's related terms. Retro gaming we've already seen. Uh, but the compatibility is another, another big thing. So that's broadly defined as being able to run software or use hardware from another computer without needing it to be changed. And similar to that, you've got legacy. And that's a kind of related term. It's kind of when things become obsolete. So they're still usable. People still have them. Uh, but it's kind of no longer the best way. So maybe uh, PS2 keyboards, uh, when you've got USB, ID, ID hard disks when everyone's got SATA, and stuff like that. So it's kind of things that the industry's moving away from, but people have lots of still, and people want to use, so they still get supported. Um, and for me, reverse engineering is the main thing about uh, emulation. Um, just the fun of discovering a system and understanding it. Um, so I guess like one of the obvious things is if you look at the PC, this is from 1981, the IBM 5150. And even though, obviously, it's light years away from the current PCs of the day, it's, the modern PC is still very recognizably similar. If you turn on your modern PC, it still probably boots up into CGA mode. It will probably still try and boot from a floppy disk if you had one if you even find a motherboard that still has one uh, support for that. But it will still boot up with the kind of one mega ma maximum memory emulation. It will stu still run 8x6 code. And so I guess the, how PCs have succeeded so well is just the ability for each generation to build on what was there before and extend it. Um, and that's basically the legacy of PCs um, that just continue improvement. Um, I'd like to talk about serial terminals, uh, just because the nature of serial communications is massively interesting in itself, um, and how that's kind of been surpassed by USB and Ethernet now. But um, I'll skip that for time reasons. So I guess reasons why we should want to emulate. So if you're making a computer or something, then like I've, I've just hinted at, if you're compatible with the previous generation, you've got a ready-made market, a customer base. Uh, people can move onto your 
to the newer system gradually. They don't have to ditch all their old software. Uh, and with faster processors, more memory, they can do more with the stuff. So it basically encourages people to move to the new hardware and then start using new features. Um, and if you look historically, hardware used to be considered something that was expensive and hard to do. So I remember reading about Zilog when they set up uh, to some fabs to make the Z80 back in the late 70s. And they were talking of billions of dollars to set up, a, set up the line to, to produce this chip. Uh, it's a slow process. If you make mistakes, it's very costly to rectify. Um, and despite the high cost of making hardware, um, it becomes fairly obsolete rapidly, so you can't rewire the innards of a chip. It's basically, once it's made, it's made. Uh, and software, by comparison, was very easy. It was almost considered throwaway compared to hardware. Um, but I guess the upside of that is the barrier to entry was so low. So anyone with an assembler or a compiler or even editing things by he in hex could could make a program system. And so as a result, there's lots of software. Um, and there's also software that, I guess, because there's such a proliferation of software, there's software that isn't necessarily maintained anymore. For instance, if a company goes out of business or someone's no longer interested in it, um, but people still want to use that software. So um, as a result, software has almost become the defining thing of a computer rather than, rather than hardware. Um, and if, even if you look at complexity nowadays, uh, a modern software project might be millions of lines of code, uh, might have thousands or uh, well, hundreds or thousands of developers on a single project. And CPUs, they've got bigger, they've got faster. Uh, so you, modern CPUs might have billions of transistors compared to the 4004, which had a few thousand. Um, but actually, complexity, the complexity of a chip hasn't necessarily gone up as much. So half the chip might just be RAM caches or duplicated cores or extra registers. So conceptually, it's... It's obviously more complicated, but conceptually, there's lots of repeated structures that are fairly, uh, fairly easy to comprehend. And I, I think that's borne out just by the number of uh, CPU designers there are in the world, which I don't actually know the figures, but I'm guessing it's in the, the thousands, maybe tens of thousands. And if you look at software developers, you will have millions worldwide. Um, and I guess the upside of that, the opposite side of that, is that so systems that don't get emulated uh, become expensive to maintain. So like the arcade boards we talked about earlier, um, as you stop being able to buy parts for them, as you stop being able to replace them, um, then the systems become no longer viable. Um, and so the software on those systems becomes lost. Um, Equally, if you're, you're building hardware, there are kind of reasons why you would want not to be emulated yourself. So if a competitor system does everything yours does um, and it does something else, then the only reason to choose yours is either brand name or price. Uh, there's also, for consoles particularly, have been very keen to kind of prevent discovery of their secrets due, uh, because they want to protect regional lock-in, copy protection. All of these things kind of help increase their revenue stream. So why, why me? Why should I write an emulator? And I guess, for me, the main thing is just fun. Um, as I've said already, it's kind of a great way of getting to know a machine. And that's really what drives me in computing. Uh, you'll certainly understand the instructions at the CPU once you've emulated it, because you'll need to, to study it in depth. You'll need to understand every instruction. And the things you'll learn doing that are very applicable to other CPUs. Um, you'll be staring at a lot of code, probably trying to figure out why it's not running in your emulator. Uh, so you'll either appreciate, on older machines, you'll appreciate lots of handwritten code. On newer machines, you'll probably see lots of compiler-generated code. And just the idioms that are used by the compilers will help you better understand how compilers work. And these, these nuggets of information that you'll learn are very transferable to other CPUs. Um, and you'll learn great things about how to optimize code from that. Uh, I'll skip over state machines, but, um, but yeah, essentially you'll um, just learn basically the entire, entire the machine. So I think the best thing about older systems is that you can really understand what every bit of the hardware is doing. If you look at a modern PC, you might be an expert at graphics, you might be an expert at network communications, all these areas, but there's so much other stuff going on that probably the rest of the machine, it's just like, oh, it just does its thing. Don't need to worry about that. And so in the words of Yoda, much to learn you'll still have. And I won't do any more Yoda impressions because I suck. So. <laughs> uh,
So yeah, the other, one of the main things you'll learn that's useful outside of emulation work is just the ability to follow a design. By its nature, you're following someone else's design for a system, and quite often you won't know what that design is, and you'll have to figure that out for yourself. Um, you'll often have to kind of, you'll come across a solution and not really understand it, and like, I mean, I've, oftentimes I've looked at something and just thought, what on earth were these guys thinking? It's crazy. Um, but actually, if you kind of look at the problems they were facing, what they were trying to solve, then when you actually look at the solution in that context, you'll probably learn something new, particularly if it, it seems strange to start with. The fact that then it makes sense at the end will kind of change your thinking of things. And you'll learn a lot writing an emulator, and particularly if you've only ever written software, um, then just learning to think about how hardware works will just give you massive, massively new insights into computing. And so for me, emulation is really a combination of detective work and research. Uh, I'll mention test-driven development, because that's obviously a buzzword in, uh, and kind of a very common methodology in software development. But actually, emulators are, are almost the perfect fit for that. Probably when you, when you start making an emulator, you'll ignore everything I've said about tests, and you'll just dive straight in, start emulating the CPU. But even if you do that, just log absolutely everything. Uh, disassemble every instruction as you're running it. Uh, if it's something simple like the 6502, dump out the registers with each instruction. If it's something more complicated, you might just want to do the registers that have changed, maybe memory accesses and things like that. Um, but this, this log file will be great for debugging. Uh, you can see exactly what's happened when you make changes in the future. If you've kept all your log files, you can see how any changes you've made will affect the, the code and the results. And there's also a benefit that for a lot of systems, uh, people have already written these kind of tests for the air emulator or just to test the hardware. And so, for instance, there's NES test for the 6502, which will test the C six CPU very thoroughly. It'll also test the other bits of NES hardware for ZAT, there's uh, ZEX all, and there's a whole host of these things. And it's really useful having a log file and being able to compare it against something that you know is correct. Um, ultimately, you'll almost certainly want to turn that off when you've finished, but for development, it will help massively. But going back to tests, just the nature of how a system fits together is very amenable to testing. So you've got a CPU, which generally is in, in charge of things. So you can replace the boot ROM and have it doing a known test that you want to do, and you can see the results, and you can test that reliably. All of the, the other features of the computer um, they're all kind of candidates for testing. So the CPU will typically start something on another, on another chip, and sometime later there'll be a result or an interrupt or something like that. Uh, but all of these things are prime candidates for test-driven development. Um, the other thing is, obviously, you presumably have written the emulator for a purpose. Um, so anything that you've got on that system that you particularly want to run, that can be your metric of whether your emulator works. Um, but probably the most fundamental um, rule that I can give you about emulation is to write anything that you're not clear about in documentation, anything that's a bit dubious, could be one way, it could be another, is write a test program, run it on the real hardware, and check your emulator does the same. And if it doesn't, decide whether it matters to you or whether it's something you need to fix. Uh, so op optimization, I guess. Uh, sorry. So Donald Niff was famously once said, like premature optimization is the root of all evil, and I guess that applies very much to emulation. Um, for most systems, you're probably not going to be hitting the boundaries of of execution time in your emulation unless it's a very current system. Um, it's worth starting off with unoptimized code, even if it actually runs slower than the thing you're trying to emulate. It's worth doing it for just ability to be, check it's correct. Um, and yeah, if, if you make a mistake, it's better to change it in one place than all your optimized variants or something. Uh, and obviously, if you've done test-driven development, you can then replace all that code and know it will still work when you test pass. Um, I also find it's best not to implement things until they're needed, because otherwise you won't have a test case. Uh, and yeah, the system, generally, if your, your emulation will b give the same results every time, which is also fantastic for testing and also helping to optimize things. So if you're 
so I guess one way, I'm jumping ahead slightly, but if you are trying to decode in a CPU instruction, um, I guess there's a couple of choices, and it's related to optimization. But um, if you want to be accurate to the hardware, you might choose to just look at certain bits, determine the type of instruction, and then do the appropriate thing. And that's what emulators, uh, that's what the hardware itself does. But obviously, CPUs aren't particularly a good match for lots of bitwise comparisons and things, because they're generally quite slow. Um, so I guess, I mean, that's one of the thing, decisions you'll discover early on, whether you want to try and parse the bits in the instructions, or have a big lookup table, for instance, or a switch statement. Uh, if you're doing a switch statement, C, uh, C and C++ hash defines can massively help. Uh, but my preferred approach is to have a function per, per instruction, and then you can kind of use that as, as appropriate. Uh, having heat maps is very good, so you might choose to see how often a particular instruction is executed, uh, and that will help you decide if you want to optimize that instruction more or make it more specific variants of it. Also, heat maps on the program counter can be very useful when you're debugging. Uh, so for instance, if you see particular areas are used a lot, uh, you can kind of move into the, the realm of the, uh, dynamic code generation. So you could either substitute that function with an already decoded uh, function, or you can, if you know that there's a sequence of 20 instructions with no branches from it, no branches to it in the middle, you can you can generate that whole block of code as a single thing and replace it in. So that, that can massively speed up your execution time. So if you're doing a, a fast system that you want to emulate, that's really useful. And other things that really help in debugging are things like mapping, marking areas that have been read to or written to, possibly the program counter that that data was modified at, and breakpoints on data. So I've kind of jumped ahead, but if you're starting a system, stop. Um, so components of a system is you generally have a CPU. Some of the really old arcade boards were built with discrete logic, but generally you've got a CPU or multiple CPUs. You'll have memory. Uh, you'll probably have some kind of video output, maybe graphics hardware. You've probably got audio. You've got storage. You've got other I/O, so keyboard, mice, uh, joysticks, that kind of thing. But the thing that really defines the system is the glue logic, uh, and that's what holds everything together. It's what gives the system its character, uh, puts things at certain memory addresses and things. And for older systems, that might well have been discrete logic. Uh, so lots and lots of chips doing all your logic. Uh, as, obviously, time went on to drive down costs, people used ULAs, PLDs, FPGAs, and ASICs. And these are all the same kind of thing. They're all uh, blocks of logic that can be programmed either dynamically for FPGAs or in the factory, but they can be made customized very cheaply uh, for, well, relatively cheaply for mass production. Uh, but they, yeah, they're a lot cheaper than doing uh, custom chips. Uh, so to understand your system, first advice is Google it. So Commodore 64, for example, you Google it. And Wikipedia, the first result tells you that it's a 6510, tells you it's got a VIC-2 chip, a sound, uh, SID chip for sound, it's got CIAs. And all of these things, they might just be meaningless numbers. Uh, but you can, they're a start to Google further. And in this case, because it's a well-known system, they actually have links that take you directly to more information. Other things, like Googling the Amstrad, says it's a Z80. It's like, well, that's not very helpful. So if you Google a bit more, you might find a picture of the circuit board. If you can't find something like that, you can just open it up and have a look. And you'll see here you've got the uh, sound chip at the bottom. You've got the 6845 video hardware in the middle on the left. And then you've got effectively like the CIA is the, the parallel chip at the top. Uh, Z80 on the right, and so on. So all these chips have numbers on. You can Google the numbers, find out what they are. Um, and that kind of thing will give you a good understanding of the system. You might be very lucky and find a schematic. So here's one for the Amstrad. Uh, it's part of the engineer's manual. And that will tell you exactly how everything's wired up. There's very little guesswork involved. But there's still the ULA in the bottom right, which is a bit of an unknown. Uh, the other thing is look for data sheets for all these, chi all these chips. So here's for the Z80, for example. It gives you very unambiguous timing diagrams for everything the CPU is doing. It will tell you how the instructions are decoded. 
So you can see here that you've got one class of instruction, but there's various bits. And more importantly for emulation, it will tell you exactly how to emulate it. So different manufacturers have different amounts of data, but it's very useful. If you can't find this stuff, then decapping is an option. I wouldn't advise doing it yourself. It involves fuming nitric acid, probably hurt your fingers. But there are people mad enough to do it. Uh, so like the Visual 6502 team, uh, who have famously kind of done this, got mis microscope images of the chip, and then have made a JavaScript emulator of the 6502, where you can see, you almost see the electrons going around through every transistor, and it's, it's phenomenal. Um, but you can see here that you can start to see all the wiring of the internals of the chip. So suddenly, it's no longer a black box. It's something that you can reason about and understand with enough patience. Um, so now you've got a clue what you're emulating. Decide on your goal. So I mean, that massively influences how you design your emulator. Um, so for instance, you might want to just have a serial-based CPM system. That's about as easy as it gets. You've got serial hardware, so, and you've got a Z80, and that's it. Uh, you might only want to care about certain bits of, bits of software or hardware. So for instance, that you can get uh, emulators for, say, the Commodore 64 that kind of wrap up the the thing just so that they can get the sound output. So it doesn't matter about the video hardware or anything else that's complicated. All they care about is the sound. So that kind of thing. Um, but more likely, you'll probably want to, to focus on exact CPU timings. Uh, that way, if you kind of aim for that at the start, you'll run, be able to run more software. Um, certainly, games and demos will almost always require that kind of accuracy. Um, but it helps that every chip is kind of synchronized with each other in hardware somehow. Uh, usually that's by a single clock, uh, which is quite often driven by the video timings. Um, yep. The other thing is you might want to consider o optional add-ons, so for instance, light pens, speech synthesizers, all that kind of stuff. You can kind of emulate it with modern hardware. A lot of that will depend on nostalgia and whether you ever had that stuff when you were younger. So the CPU. Um, Probably one of the things you want to consider early on is instruction pipelining. This is something that's actually on most CPUs, whether it's obvious or not. Um, but generally, you've got several phases of your. It's not just an instruction appears and is executed. So you've got instruction fetch, which is fetching that instruction from memory, decoding it, executing the instruction, any memory writes, and then register writes. Um, and you can actually par parallelize most of those things. Um, so quite often, whilst the, instruction, the current instruction is being decoded, the next one's being fetched, um, things like that. So that will have an implication for things like branch delay slots. So on some, some CPUs, um, when you've got a branch, if it's a conditional branch, the, the CPU doesn't know at the time whether it's going to be taken or not. Uh, so it might either choose to stall until that result is available. Some of them fetch the instruction at both addresses. Uh, some, for instance, the Spark and the MIPS will kind of execute that next instruction that they've already fetched anyway. Uh, you've got similar things with registers. Uh, so if you've got a multiply which might take 50 cycles, uh, then obviously that result will take longer. So some CPUs will stall until that result's available. Others will wait, will kind of reorder instructions. Uh, some CPUs will kind of return the old results. Uh, and that's usually called the latency of the instruction. So all these things are options. Uh, and one to be especially aware of is memory access. So in the old days of 8-bit machines, probably a memory access was about one cycle. Uh, nowadays, with things in the gigahertz, it could be hundreds or thousands of cycles before memory is memory's returned. So a lot of modern CPUs spend a lot of time trying to reorder things to avoid these stores. Uh, memory, obviously, is very important. So how you handle mem memory will have, stop, will have a big implication on how you design your system. Uh, but typically, it's the top address bits. Uh, no, sorry, the top address bit bits are used to determine which region of the memory it is. Uh, so, for instance, the Amstrad is simple. It's got four banks of 16K that are either ROM or RAM. They can be paged pretty independently. But a lot of systems will have memory mapped I/O. This is particularly typical of RISC chips. Uh, but also, the 6502 is somewhat risky, um, and so we'll have memory mapped I/O. Uh, so, I think 
generally the best way to approach memory is to have a set of functions, uh, which, uh, for instance, here, read byte and write byte, and put those in a in an interface or virtual or abstract class, depending on your terminology. Um, and just have a lookup table and choose whatever page size is appropriate for the system. Uh, and the advantage of doing that is if you've got a memory access, you can very quickly jump to the appropriate routine. So if it's a memory read or write, the normal case, you can handle that quickly. If it's something more complicated like a memory mapped IA, you can then, in that function, you can then check what address it is and do the appropriate thing for that register. Uh, stop. Uh, and yeah, here's just a quick example of a memory map. So you can see how the Commodore 64 has got 64K of RAM. You can optionally page ROM over the top of it, and you've got a chunk of I.O. that kind of controls all the hardware registers. Um, so next thing to consider is video output. Uh, so some systems are very simple. So for instance, the Spectrum has a fixed screen. You can't do anything to change it. And it's quite tempting to just think, well, I'll render all that frame at once and then do how many cycles it is, 20,000, 60,000, whatever it is, uh, cycles, and then process the next frame and so on. But doing things like that means that you're unable to do various effects. So for instance, the thing, one of the hallmarks of the Spectrum is its loading bars. And if you're kind of unless you're interleaving CPU and rendering code, for instance, then you completely miss that kind of effect. And some systems, it's absolutely essential that you interleave CPU and other hardware. So 2600, um, you probably heard of racing the beam, all that kind of stuff where typically the older the system gets, the more the requirement for accurate cycle counting. Uh, the newer it gets, the more things are kind of semi-autonomous chips that do their thing. Uh, so you might have programmable hardware. So the 6845 on the CPU, IBM and BBC can be configured for uh, NTSC mode, PAL mode. You could even get it to do VGA signals. Um, and so that kind of thing, you, you kind of need to be dealing with that fairly accurately and regularly. The, the, P, uh, the CPU could reconfigure any of these registers at any time. And a lot of demos will use these effects. Uh, you might have tiled video memory. So for instance, on the IBM, the text mode, it reads the character from RAM and then uses those, those bits that represent the character as address lines into the ROM. And that's optionally used on the Commodore 64. It's, it's used on the NES. And the reason for that is older systems, it kind of just speeds, speeds things up by reducing the amount that you need to write to, to draw to the screen. Memory contention is a big one for video. So your CPU is the primary user of the memory. It's hitting it almost continually. Um, but your video hardware is the next, next main user of memory. Uh, some of the older systems, you can get lucky. Uh, and so you might be able to arrange for the CPU to use alternate cycles and the video to use big ones in the gap. Um, sometimes where the hardware doesn't really cooperate with that. So the 6502 actually is idle for half the time, so you can do that. Things like the Z80, it isn't idle for that time. So for instance, the Amstrad forces everything to be multiple of four cycles to enable that. Other systems like the IBM don't do that. They just, uh, yeah, they just kind of run the code. So if you've got the video and the CPU trying to access the memory at the same time, you've got a problem. Uh, so that's often resolved by a CPU stall. Other times where the CPU is considered more important, you might get graphical corruption. So for instance, video snow on CGA uh, cards. Uh, another thing to consider is the frame rate you're running at. Uh, if that's similar to the system that you're running, so the system you're running the emulator on is similar to the target system, then it's not too bad. Um, otherwise, you'll have to change something. Uh, it's easiest to change the speed of the CPU to match. Um, and for instance, if you're emulating an NTSC system, then there's 0.1% difference. So any audio speed up won't be noticed. If you've got a power system, it's more complicated. You'll probably only want to render five of six frames and stretch out the audio a bit, or well, so that the audio is the right speed. Uh, but then that will lead to judder on your, on your video. Or you could try and blend the frames. Uh, kind of doing alpha blending and have 20%, 40%, 60%. But if you're kind of trying to emulate pixel effects, then that will look pretty rubbish as well. Uh, so there's lots of compromises, and you have to make a decision. 
Uh, personally, I think this is one reason why hardware is better, because you can just plug it into a TV and job done. Uh, I'll skip over this, but this was just an example to try and change how your, your thinking works. So, for instance, you've got your addressable screen here, and what's left of that, so normally the border, is actually on the right-hand side. Uh, the top border is off at the bottom. And so just think this is just an example of how thinking about the hardware changes how you, how you think about the machine and just generally will change how you think about other things in the future. Uh, sound, again, can be very simple. No sound, simple beeper on the spectrum or something with many, many channels, possibly even MIDI. Um, if, again, I've said before, but if it's something simple, a CPU-controlled beeper, you'll definitely want to uh, count your cycles very accurately, otherwise the tone of the, the sound will change dramatically. Uh, if you've got a chip that's doing, doing the sound generation itself, that's less important. So for instance, uh, the AY8192, typically you might program it 50 times a second, 100 times a second, or sometimes faster, but it's generally not that frequently, uh, but there are still important things. So, like the hardware en envelope gets reset as soon as you write the register. So, that can have a, a big difference if you do it a frame late, for instance. Uh, you might need a lookup table to compensate for any hardware on the on the motherboard and things like that. Uh, input, uh, just briefly. Most keyboards are kind of like this matrix design. Uh, so typically, you'd have all your columns, or well, columns and rows are interchangeable in this, but you'd have all your columns with pull-up resistors. You'd drive a row low down to ground. And if any buttons are pressed, then those columns would also appear, appear as ground. Um, so you can uh, very simply scan the keyboard by doing a row at a time and seeing what columns are pressed. Uh, you can see even on the schematic where that matrix appears. And the Amstrad also cheats and uses the same thing for the joysticks. So there's all sorts of nice shortcuts you can do like that with hardware. Um, storage, I'll gloss over this. But again, with emulation in general and trying to reuse existing things, uh, if there's an existing disk format or tape format for, for, your, for emulators for your platform, then you might as well use them because then people have a ready supply of software to run on your, on your emulator. Uh, there might be test cases, all sorts of things. And snapshots are very useful as well. So they can be people playing, using your emulator to play games, might want to use them to do boss, boss fights or speed runs or that, that kind of thing. But actually, it's very useful for debugging. Uh, if something crashes in the emulator, you can go back to the, the previous snapshot. So if you do it every frame, say, then it's a relatively short amount of single stepping or kind of breakpointing to find where your emulator goes wrong. Uh, and glue logic, this is the thing that essentially defines a system. It's also, unfortunately, the hardest thing documentation-wise. Uh, probably if it's a well-documented computer, the interface you would see as a programmer is well documented, so you can infer quite a lot of how that chip is designed from that. But the internals are almost not, never documented publicly. Uh, you might see strange behavior that actually turns out to be the result of a simple set of rules and things kind of interfering with each other. Um, I would say for any of this glue logic and the stuff that defines a machine, if you don't know the machine well already, if you look for how to program documents, they'll often talk about um, kind of just how to get started. It will give you an inclination, uh, kind of a, a good grounding point on how to get going with that, with that chip. Um, and I guess there's also a, a caveat with that, is that sometimes these documents will gloss over either very simple things that they think everyone would know this, or very hard things that the author of the document doesn't know. So I guess if there's something missing, try and figure out why it's missing. Um, but again, everything that looks odd, there's almost certainly a good reason. It's usually for cost, so reducing gates, or for speed. Uh, and the other thing to bear in mind is proprietary systems probably have all this information is NDA'd or possibly never even disclosed to developers. Uh, but sometimes you can find very interesting information in patent documents. When it's working, you might have a cube. Result. <laughs> so hardware. Um, why would you make hardware? Well, obviously, hardware is always cooler. Uh, you can make a drop-in replacement, plug it into the TV, just having a dedicated box sitting there 
feels more authentic, even if it's not the real hardware itself. The fact that it boots up and immediately goes to the emulator makes it feel like the real thing. Uh, but even just for development, just trying to figure out how hardware works and then replicating it in software, you're constantly shifting your mindset. And I find it's very useful to look at a chip, try and work out how they did it, why they made decisions to optimize things at gates, and that will kind of inform how you design the hardware version or FPGA version. And as always, the reason for doing anything is you learn something new. So I got into doing this because I wanted to learn about FPGAs. I'd bought a development kit and it had been sat on my shelf for a year, so I thought it'd be a fantastic way of learning. So FPGAs are nothing like CPUs. So I'll just let you look at that for a bit and get scared. Um, and essentially, an FPGA will have hundreds or thousands of these things, and they're all identical, generally. Um, and they're just complicated bits of logic. Um, and essentially, you'll have, it's very similar to the ULAs and PLDs and things that we talked about earlier that were kind of the very early custom chips. The FPGA's main advantage is they're configurable by the software at boot time, usually, or, or via flash RAM. Um, but essentially, the main building block are these big squares on the left, and they're lookup tables. So, that, so depending on the chip, there might be four-bit input or six-bit input, and you can have some combination of logic in there. So you might have two AND gates and a NOR or something like that, and have a single bit of output. And then you can configure the outputs going to different inputs in various ways, and that's all fairly magical. Um, the best thing is you don't really have to worry about that. The synthesizer takes care of pretty much all of it. Uh, I'll try and show you a bit later on if I have time. Uh, but yeah, essentially, these things are completely configurable logic. You can pretty much represent any binary circuit with them. You can also, as well as using them as lookup tables, they can be used as RAM, like small bits of RAM, 16 bits, or shift registers, or they're, they're very configurable. Um, the other good thing that's worth bearing in mind for FPGAs is you're not constrained by bits and bytes and, well, you're constrained by bits, not constrained by bytes or words or anything that you're used to for CPUs. So if you need something that's five bits, you only use five bits. If you need something that's 35 bits, you don't have to worry about moving up to 64. You use exactly what you want. Uh, and other elements in FPGA are these RAM blocks. So they have different names depending on the manufacturer. Uh, but they're small bit chunks of RAM, static RAM, that are built into the FPGAs. You can use them for all sorts of things. So for an emulator, you'll probably want to use them for registers, maybe small caches. You can use them for delay lines. So I use them for buffering the video. For instance, if you want to double scan something or fix some audio out, uh, video output. Uh, you can even use them for complicated lookup tables. So if you remember, those lookup tables were six-bit input. You can effectively use these like you would use a ROM lookup table, for instance, pre-calculated sine rays or anything. But you can use them for, for say, 256-bit input. No, not that big, actually, probably. Uh, probably, certainly, maybe 20-bit input lookup tables. Um, so things like that, you can have very complicated logic with like however many outputs as well are in the ROM. Uh, so that's often useful for instruction decode tables, that kind of thing. And in, in fact, most CPUs will have an instruction decode table that's effectively a miniature ROM. Um, because they're configured at boot time, you can use them as boot ROMs for the target CPU. Uh, you can reconfigure them. So internally, they're, they're 18 kilobits, and you can, you can have them in all sorts of combinations. So they effectively, they work on kind of nominally a nine a 9-bit byte, so with parity. Uh, so you can configure them up to 36 bits wide, or you can shrink them down. If you shrink them down, you lose that extra bit, but sometimes that's more useful to have a single bit with a big array and things like that. You can stack them together, so depending on the size of the chip, you'll have many of these. They're dual-ported, so you can have one thing that's constantly putting data in, another thing that's reading, uh, reading that data out. You can have rules. You can program them so if you read and write the same address, whether it does the write and then the read or the read and the write. And these things are very fast. like They can be up to 300 megahertz or so. So they're ideal for caches and emulating older systems. Um, and yeah, if you're doing hardware designs, then just get in the habit of modularizing everything. 
it's very much encouraged with Verilog and VHDL. Uh, and it's also, not only is it useful for sharing between projects, so you might design your PS2 keyboard interface, flash ROM interface, uh, your DRAM driver, all these kind of things, and then share them across a bunch of emulators. Um, yeah, but the other thing as well is if you, because FPGAs are inherently parallel, if, if, say, for instance, you wanted a special version of your, your machine to have two sound chips instead of one, you can just duplicate that element and just stick it another I.O. address, and suddenly you can make something that's much better than the original machine, but still compatible. Um, and obviously, if you've modularized things, it's easier to fix bugs and replace, replace it many times. Clocks are the most interesting thing about FPGAs in that they're a lot of pain, but also very flexible. Um, so most FPGAs will have a lot of circuitry devoted to clocks, so you'll probably have a, a clock management system. They come by different names. Uh, but generally, they can do things like uh, frequency multiplication, frequency division, um, phase lock loops to uh, approximately synthesized chips and uh, uh, approximately synthesized clocks and all sorts of things. So. To a large degree, you can you often have one, two, or three of these things. So you can often synthesize um, a lot of other frequencies from an input chip. So, for instance, in my design, I use a 16 megahertz input clock. I first thing I do is I multiply that up to a 96 megahertz clock, and I use that for everything else. Um, you could multiply it up to a faster thing, and then do kind of integer division in in logic and kind of divide that to uh, kind of pretty much any clock speed you want. Uh, however, you do have limited clock resources. Um, the thing about clocks is you kind of want them everywhere at the same time. And most FPGAs will only have a few uh, global clocks. So I think the chip I use has eight. Uh, and these are special pathways around the chip that distribute that clock to everywhere on the chip as quickly as possible. Uh, so once you're doing this kind of electronics, you start to run into the limitations of kind of speed of propagation of, of gates. And so all this circuitry is kind of designed to get the clocks as quickly as possible, and so that everywhere has the same idea of the clock. Um, so one of the things you want to avoid with an FPGA design is having lots of clocks. Ideally, you just want one or two. Um, so it comes back to kind of one of the one of the main things about uh, electronic circuit design is when the signal is changing, so for instance, if it changes from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0, during that transition point, it's, I guess we're kind of, in software land, we kind of just think of that as a nice smooth transition, an instant transition from 0 to 1. In electronics, because these systems are essentially analog, um, you actually have a kind of a graduated thing. At any point, some things might say it's a, a naught or a one. They're not too sure. Um, so if you're sampling that signal, unless you know that you're in a, a good frame of reference point for that signal, um, then you might well have a read error. And so if you're if you're reading things that's clock to one clock, and then you're, a different system is using a different clock and trying to look at that signal, there's potentially sources of errors. So there's all sorts of ways around it and ways, uh, defined ways of kind of reading things across clock domains. But ideally, it's easier if you have one. Uh, so I would advise that. Uh, if you do make too fast a clock and then use that for everything, you'll probably get clock uh, synthesizing, synthesizer warnings. Um, but actually, some of those can be ignored if you know that, for instance, you're actually clocking it down to 4 megahertz, and so it warns you that it can't possibly be done in time, but actually it can. But, um, but yeah, clocks are kind of great and bad at the same time. Uh, one of the things that's hardest to kind of get your head around. And often, actually, oh, sorry, I just jumped ahead. Often, actually, you won't necessarily know you're heading towards a problem until suddenly your design stops working. So one of my earliest designs, I ended up with about 10 clocks in my design, and I didn't realize, and then I added one more. So I was working on my, my PS2 inter keyboard interface at the time, and I was just changing something on that, and suddenly the sound stopped working. And it's like, what's going on? And it decided to reroute 
every, all the signals on my board to try and work around this new clock I'd used. Um, and so stuff like that can catch you out, so if, as few clocks as possible. Um, yeah, again, as I've said before, stepping back from the problem, trying to figure out what the person who designed the original hardware was doing is a great way to think about problems in the FPGA. So I remember when I was looking at the AY8192 sound chip, um, kind of just actually thinking about how they've designed it to reduce gates, because there's lots of stuff, and most software emulators of that will have lots and lots of lookup tables of various amplitudes and stuff. And actually, a couple of hours looking at the problem, trying to see what's being solved, and you can simplify that a lot. Um, the other thing about uh, hardware designs is that there are certain operations that we take for granted and are actually really expensive from a hardware point of view. Uh, so for instance, if you're doing, okay, uh, if you're doing any kind of comparisons for less than or less than or equal to, it's almost certainly the wrong design. That kind of thing is very expensive. You've got extra carry flags floating around. Um, so I guess from a software point of view, you might think how you do a multi-byte compare and just having to do if this is less than this or this is equal to this and that's less than this and extending that many times over. Think of that as many bits it done individually and you get a feel for how complicated it becomes. So typically systems will check for equality on bits and even more easily is checking for all bits are zero or all bits are one. Um, so a lot of counters will set it to a known value and either increment it or decrement it. So very much like Z80 where you'd set the B register to say 100 and then have a loop with DJ and Z at the end and it'll repeat that section of code 100 times. Um, some older systems kind of take this kind of optimization even further and they have a linear feedback shift, shift register to do counters which is kind of the optimal for gates, but you look at the number that's put into it and try and work out how that relates to the count, and it's quite complicated. But essentially, shift registers are great for that kind of thing. So the, the, the theory behind that is that you, you can build a, shift, a feedback shift register of, say, seven bits, and it will repeat. Well, if you choose the right set of, of, of feedback loops, um, that might, would repeat with a pattern of two to the seven minus one uh, cycle, cycles in that loop. So you can use them for counters, uh, and people used to. Um, so this is the board I built. Uh, so this was uh, solely done because I was using a development board, which kind of wasn't really very suitable. So it didn't have the things I actually wanted, like a SCART output and joysticks. and. So I'd built those as little modules that I'd plugged into it, but eventually I'd hit the limit of what that, that chip could do. And so I just decided that instead of buying another board, I would learn how to make it. So again, learning is fun. Uh, and so I just kind of got the data sheet for the chip, figured out how to make a board. Uh, this was the second version of it, but uh, yeah, it's good fun, uh, something to learn. So you see I've got uh, so the chip, so the big chip in the middle is the FPGA. It's directly connected to the, to the static RAM underneath it. There's a little tiny chip just to the right of the FPGA, which is like half a meg of ROM, but that's serial. That's actually the reason I've got a really high clock, clock for 96 megahertz, uh, so that I can actually give an instruction every CPU, every fourth CPU instruction, so I can emulate ROM with that. Um, but yeah, it's just great to have a go at building things. Um, and obviously now there are other boards available. So for instance, there's Minimig, there's Mist, uh, there's a couple of Spectrum ones. I even saw an MSX FPGA emulator when I was wandering around yesterday. So there's lots of these kind of things available. So, but I think it's fun to build one. Like I found building it myself, obviously there was lots of learning and lots of time involved, but it cost me about half of buying someone else's. Uh, and here's a few references, uh, just go through them. The top one's my blog, which I, worryingly discovered yesterday I haven't blogged on for a, about a year, so since last year when I, when I talked about my demo. Uh, but yeah, the Spectrum ULA book is a fantastic read. I highly recommend it. Uh, I got started on FPGAs with the uh, prototy Prototyping of Digital Systems book. Uh, Visual 6502, well for worth reading. Ken Shearer's blog is fantastic. Uh, so he, he's got a massively diverse set of interests from decapping chips to looking at CPU and how CPUs work. 
Z80 info has anything you'd possibly want to know about the Z80. NESDEV, anything you want to know about the NES, world of spectrum, similarly for spectrum. Uh, and that's another photo of my board with a case I made. And just a quick example, I, uh, this is just kind of how you'd kind of translate from C into, into VHDL. And you'll see that it's actually very similar. Um, so you can be explicit about it and kind of have integers and give explicit ranges, or you can do things in bits, which I prefer to do. Uh, but again, you can see that I've got, say, two 16-bit registers going in and a 17-bit result coming out, and a 32-bit product coming out. Um, and so you can write things in logic or you can write things with arithmetic stuff, and the synthesizer will take care of a lot of the details. So it's actually quite pleasant writing this kind of code. And that's the end. Any questions? Yeah, great talk so far. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, in the beginning, you talked about the 64, uh, C64 computer. Yep. So it has a hardware VIC um, GPU chip, if you want. Yep. And um, the developers, the coders, um, found some hardware bugs, like the switching between um, 25, 24 lines right. of the screen, which, which opens the borders. How do you can implement something like this? Or how can you find this? Because it's undocumented. It did. Yeah, I guess. I mean, so I don't have much experience with a Commodore. Uh, but so I guess, I mean, there's certain things, parallels on the Amstrad that you kind of you can find by experimentation. So if there are bits in, in hardware registers that are undocumented, so say you've got 10 bits seem to have a purpose, then you've got a bit gap, and then a couple more bits do something else, then it's like the obvious question is, what does that bit do? So you can try uh, tweaking it, see what happens. Um, for Commodore stuff, actually, Bill Hurd is very vocal on forums like this where people will talk about how the units of chips work. So Hacker Day, actually, I should have put on here. Uh, he's quite frequently got videos on there about the internals of stuff and stuff he has a vague recollection of working on, things like that. Um, so but all of that stuff is fascinating. So sometimes you'll never know that there was certain stuff there. But quite often, if you've got a block of hardware registers, you might want to probe beyond it to see if they do anything whether they give you an address exception if your CPU supports that or that kind of thing. It's always worth seeing what else is around kind of the areas that you're looking at. Uh, but yeah, some things are designed that you don't discover them. So. Uh, thank you. Um, is it uh, on an FPGA system? Is it also difficult to emulate a bus instead of a clock, or uh, would that be a different approach? Uh, well, they're, they're kind of different things. So the clock is the best way of synchronizing things, yeah. uh, of talking to each other. So you. So I guess the concept of a bus, as you would have on a normal hardware system, you tend not to have on an FPGA. Uh, so you can have them, and you can have what are known as tri-state variable, tri-state registers. So they're either floating, or you drive them to high or low. Um, but actually, for a bus, you would tend to tend to not do that. You'd have a set of things that are input to a system and output to a system, and then the system would say, so for instance, the CPU might choose to then look at this thing from this, or this thing from this, or this thing from this. Or you could just, if you know that they're driven high when they're not being used, you can just add them all together or something like that. But but typically, you tend not to have buses as such inside FPGAs. You can do, but it's more expensive logic-wise to do that. Thank you. Well, I was just curious, uh, which FPGA chip you ended up using? Like, uh, how, how much resources did you need to make the CPC? Uh, so that was a Zilog. Zilog is quite an old chip now, so it's the... Yeah, it's Spartan 3, but I didn't yeah, see Yeah, Spartan 3, size. so it's the 400 size. 400, okay. And I think the entire CPC fitted in just over 50%. I think it's about 58%. Uh, the only thing that doesn't include is the floppy driver. So I started off implementing... So again, this goes back to 
not being like CPUs. So sequential logic is very hard to do in FPGAs. You will end up needing a state machine um, to do it efficiently. And I ended up with this massive state machine that was trying to parse a fat file system and on an SD card. And in the end, I just decided it was ridiculous. So I, I didn't actually mention it, but this chip here, that's a, a mega chip. So I use that for USB and programming the, the ROM and stuff. But because it's largely idle, um, that also runs the floppy code on there. And so I've got an 8-bit bus. Actually, no, I think I did it with Siri in the end. But there's, a, there's back and forth communication between the FPGA and that chip to do floppy. But essentially, you can do the whole of the Amstrad in half of the chip like that. Um, Nowadays, you can get much bigger chips as well. So I'm planning on doing a redesign that will be uh, probably using the LX25, which is about four times bigger and a lot faster. So. Oh, there's also very good boards on Kickstarter from time to time as well. So it's worth keeping an eye out for things. Cool. Thanks. Right. Thank you.